Hi, I'm Sami Sato. I'm the founder of a global giving initiative called B101. I beat the often pass by uh, trying to imagine a new world where everything we do in our everyday life will create a tangible and positive impact in the world. And I do so by uh, supporting businesses to uh, embed the sense of purpose and mission and the impact in their everyday business activities. So that's what I do. Welcome back to the Beat the Often Path podcast. I'm your host, Ross Palmer. On this show, we showcase unusual success stories to help us all think outside the box in our life and career and to add more meaning to this thing we call a career. Today, my guest is Masami Sato, one of the coolest people you're likely to meet out there. Seldom in my life have I had a conversation where I found myself so wholeheartedly agreeing with everything that was said. Masami has used her extensive life experience to build and improve a number of her own businesses, bringing care and humanity to everything she's touched. 14 years ago, she got the brilliant idea to find a way to inject giving into every business out there, creating her new company, B1G1. Through it, she makes it painfully easy for companies to do good without drastically changing their business model or what they've been doing all along. She's facilitated hundreds of millions in giving around the world at this point, and she's been recognized by major media and so much more. Just wait until you hear this story, folks. Here's Masami Sato, founder of B1G1. Well, welcome to the show. I'm so honored to have you here. I think it's such a wonderful business. When I discovered what you were doing, I thought, why didn't I think of something like that? On this show, I've talked to a lot of small business owners and some bigger business owners, people who have put mission into their business in some way. They either have a charity attached or what they're doing is fundamentally better for the planet. And that's the kind of story I love. But then I saw what you're up to, and you try to inject that mission into any company. And that's such a cool idea. So can you please explain for our listeners and viewers out there what exactly your business, your B Corp model is. Okay, so, um, so B1 German helps businesses embed the giving in what they do. And this is kind of a little bit hard to imagine. So let me explain uh, in this way. So imagine if, uh, let's say, every time you have a cup of coffee, a child receives access to life-saving water, or every time you download an ebook and learn something, then you get to plant a tree, or every time you go to see a doctor or a chiropractor or you know, go to a gym, uh, somebody receives access to healthcare. So imagine a world where everything you do turns into a positive impact and positive act uh, in the world. So that's actually what we try to, or we make it happen, <laughs> make happen. Uh, so how we do this is that uh, B1J1 has a giving platform and then also an initiative where businesses can join us. And then when they do so, they get to um, think about the main business activities that they have. And not only about the sales activities, but something like, you know, every time, uh, you know, we have a successful meeting, you know, we can celebrate that by helping educate a child for one day or planting a tree. Or So um, we have a more than 400 carefully selected high impact projects on our portal. And then businesses can say, you know, I want to link this activity with this, uh, you know, social impact. And then they can make that happen. And we have an API or we have automation uh, to track that simply too. And then as a result, when um, businesses are just doing what they are normally doing, they get to see the accumulating impact because it's about a small everyday action that can accumulate to create a big change. And making something habitual is more powerful than trying to do something just once off. So um, that's B1J1's kind of model to uh, enable every business to express the sense of purpose that they have. Well, I think that's brilliant. Again, it's one of those things that sounds so simple that it's like, why didn't this exist before? But obviously, it's groundbreaking in its own way, and that's what I love about it. So tell me about your own personal background. How did you get started on building this thing? What did you do before you built it? Okay, so when I was a young child growing up in Japan, 
um, I was very, very shy and I was introverted. I didn't know how to express myself. So I was probably always the you know, most quiet child in the class. Or, and I, I had this problem trying to express myself. So if I tried to talk in front of the people, then I couldn't stop my hand shaking or I started to crying. And you know, so that was me. Um, but what happened was I grew up uh, um, spending a lot of time with my grandparents who used to run a family business in a little corner shop in Tokyo. And, and I uh, enjoyed you know, spending time with them all the school holidays and uh, helping them run this business. So I was always curious and I learned a lot about just the taking care of business, you know, helping to take care of business with my grandparents. Um, but then... What happened was when I finished studying in Japan and I had this like sense of curiosity about what was happening in the world, but I was very shy and, you know, uh, in a sense, like a little bit timid too. But then one day I decided that, well, I really want to go out and see what was going on. So that's what I did. So I became a backpacker (laughs) and uh, I spent a few years traveling around the world with like very little budget. And initially I studied English. I didn't even speak English then when I left Japan. So I had to first study English and I uh, lived and uh, stayed in Canada and then uh, traveled in the States too. I uh, went to Central America, studied Spanish, uh, backpacked in many places, went to Asia. And then um, uh, during that time, uh, everything was just so amazing because when I uh, suddenly lost my words, you know, because I couldn't speak English or I couldn't speak the local languages. So I just didn't have the words (laughs) to express myself. Uh, Suddenly, connecting with people became much easier for me compared to how it was in Japan. Because in Japan, I was trying to say the right thing, right? Because I was Japanese. I should be able to explain myself or express myself. I say that to myself every day. I'm still working on it. (laughs) I understand. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So, but when you didn't have the words and you knew you couldn't say the right thing anyway... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> then I just surrendered and I thought, well, okay, I can't say many, you know, I can't use many words, but I can just uh, smile. I could just say thank you, or I could just show the interest, the gesture. Or... Then in that very vulnerable moment in time, I realized that the, everywhere I went, there were always people who were just caring and, you know, came to help me. Uh, I was, when I was lost, there were people who guided me, supported me. Uh, many times people just invited me to come and, and, and visit their family and eat food together. <laughs> You know, all these things. And, yes. and I thought, oh my gosh, this is just so amazing because I used to think that people outside or things outside were foreign, which means very different. And as a result, it's very scary or we can't connect or we can't understand. Or, But it wasn't the case for me that wherever I went, I found the people very similar to me in many ways. You know, many ways very different, but many ways very similar. In and fundamental then, um, ways, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, I also, during that time, started to see very different realities uh, that people faced, such as, you know, even young kids uh, that, who couldn't go to school uh, because they were helping at home and working in the field or uh, kids begging on the street or uh, people with physical disability not having any help. Or, so then I started to really wonder, like, why is this happening? Because if it was happening in my own community, then surely somebody would help or do something about it. But it seems like there are lots of people who have nowhere to go and they were just getting by. And, um, but then at the same time, in those places where people had very little, they were still generous because they were saying like, oh, let's have a, come over and we have lunch together. And they were generously sharing their food. And then I used to think like, but if you give that food to me, you don't have enough for your kids, right? <laughs> and, and I felt... Uh, bad, but I eventually accepted that and realized that sometimes being able to just receive and appreciate is actually good enough. And um, (laughs) and then also when I was in like more well-to-do countries, people had enough, but then I also met many people who didn't feel fulfilled or who felt stressed or uh, who felt that they had to do more, they had to have more to feel happy, but then they weren't 
really getting there. And same for my parents in Japan. They worked really hard, but they just didn't have a time to spend in a family or they were always stressed when I was growing up. So all of this thoughts and feelings and trying to question, why is this happening? Like, why are we damaging the world, like destroying the environment or... Um, and then eventually, <laughs> sorry, this story is quite long. No, I love every I'm word. I am you. just nodding. I'm like, this is exactly <laughs> what I'm all about. I love every word. Please continue. <laughs> so, so what happened at, at that time? I was quite simplistic person. So I thought, hmm, like, you know, maybe businesses and consumerism is creating these like problems for us and for the world. So if I just stopped buying things, maybe I will contribute less to the bad <laughs> that's happening. So what I did was when I eventually went back to Japan, I um, uh, decided to move to countryside and then uh, let go of everything, uh, possessions, so that I could learn to make everything, you know, grow food with the farmers, uh, learn to build a house or even you know make pottery or clothes or so I did that for two years living in uh, this small community you know learning from farmers practicing organic natural farming and learning to live with nature and um, that was very profound time for me because um, I learned a lot and when I first started that, I was judging the world you know things are wrong and that's why I wanted to do the right thing and then that's why I went there. But then when um, I reached the end of two years, what I realized was that I was actually wrong to judge. Because even in this rural community, we still enjoy the sharing things. We exchange things. We bought things. You know, sometimes we had to buy a tool so that we can throw the ground. And so um, I couldn't disconnect myself from the world if I wanted to just enjoy living and sharing things with people I liked and cared about. So I thought, yeah, there, there are lots of things I learned, but it wasn't how to be right. <laughs> and, um, and there was this like inherent sense of trust and this security in these communities because even though we didn't have a lot and also sometimes we got hit by uh, an unexpected storm or you know climate issues but we trusted each other so if anybody in the community has an issue we all come together to help so that's why when um, uh, you know you are always willing to help but at the same time you're not afraid too much about what happened to me when something goes wrong because you know that we are here together. Yeah. So that, that was really powerful. But the, another pow uh, powerful thing I learned at that time was the concept of giving first. And so if you are a farmer and you want to have abundance, you want to have a, you know, plenty of crops like at the end of the year, one thing you had to do or you always assume that you do, everybody do, is to um, nurture the soil you know, give to the soil first and right. learn about the natural cycles and, you know, find a way to work with that in the best possible way and always appreciate what we have, but also to give consciously and uh, give first, right? Yeah. Because rather than get first. Right. <laughs> mm, so, so that was that. And then, so that like all that learning and all the experiences and all the people I met inside uh, that led to the formation of B1J1, but it didn't happen because I tried to design this perfect thing, but it just happened because one day uh, in New Zealand, when I was living in New Zealand a uh, couple of years after that, I became a mom and I had a baby in my arm. <laughs> and uh, at that time, uh, until that time, I knew the problems of the world, but they were big things. And I was a little person. I couldn't fix those big problems. And that was what, how I felt. But when I had my daughter and I looked at her and then I felt that the, I would do anything for her, you know, to make sure that she's safe, she, she's happy. But then I suddenly started to see the faces of other kids that I met when I was backpacking and, you know, connecting with people and the people who were genuinely just caring and sharing meals with me. And then I thought, like, what happened if my daughter happened to be 
one of those kids. And then the world said, sorry, you know, we, no are, we, don't, we can't no change way. the world. <laughs> yeah. We can't change the world. We can't do anything. <laughs> then what happened? And then I thought, okay, well, I still can't change the world, but maybe I should do something. And then I became an entrepreneur. So with a three-month-old baby on my back, I started my first business, which was food company. And, um, and I wanted the, that food company to uh, succeed so that we could give all the profits away to help um, feed and educate the street children. So that was the kind of like my initial entry to the entrepreneurship. And then eventually with the food company, um, we were trying to give back, but it was just so hard. You know, we are always chasing for success. And one day, you know, when we become really successful, we could do this. And then one day I just thought like, oh, actually, this is crazy because we're not doing anything. You know, five years later, we're still growing business. Business is bigger, but we're not doing anything. And then this just simple idea came to me. You know, what if we just gave one meal? from every meal we sold. And then we didn't need to wait anymore. We could just allocate a small budget from every sale of our product, at that time packaged frozen meals we are selling in Australia. And then we could actually embed that sense of giving and caring in our product and share that with our team and say, you know, thank you for doing this. Every time you are packing your food, you are helping a child receive a meal. And uh, everything changed. So anyway, then in 2007, I sold the company in Australia and moved to Singapore to start to be one one So that's wow. that kind of long story. Of that's a wonderful story. <laughs> Ordinarily, I would take this moment in the show to have a little bit of a commercial where I ask you to like and share and subscribe to the podcast to help me grow it. But I'm going to forego that this time, as I sometimes do. And I'm going to ask you instead to marinate in your own company, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're working for somebody else, how can you inject giving into what you're doing? Can you work with B1G1? Can you find a way to mimic the good that she has done? So that's it. Your homework is to think about how you can add more giving into your own work and life. That's all. Now back to the episode. I do have one quick question, though. So you started your first business, a food company. Mm. How did you fund that business? Did you have outside funding? Did you do it yourself? <laughs> well, I don't know why you asked the question, but we had no funding. Okay. I'll, I'll so tell let, you why let me... I asked. Okay, go ahead, please. No, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Tell okay. me why you I'll asked. I'll tell you why. I, because I think that there are so many people that I know, and the reason that I created this show was to help give people templates for how to make more meaning out of their life. I wanted to show mm. people, here are some examples mm. of people who have mm -hmm. beaten the often path and have succeeded. And I know so many people who have a desire in their heart to do something good. They have a desire to give back to the world, a general sense of, I want to be more, and maybe I want to use business to become more. But I think a lot of business books gloss over that moment between an idea and the first execution. They'll say, Warren mm. Buffett was sitting at home, and the next thing he was a millionaire. It's like, but wait, 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 mm -hmm. rewind, rewind. <laughs> How did we start the first thing? How did we get going in the first thing? Because a lot of people feel they need something external to start, whether it's funding or approval. And here you are with a three-month-old baby. You have an idea in your head. So that moment is incredibly important and interesting to me. Mm -mm. Yeah, so... Um... So we didn't have money. Um, and uh, so one way to start a business when you have little money or no money is uh, to find a business that you can buy for not, almost nothing. <laughs> because uh, I'm very sorry, but there are lots of businesses that are not doing well, owner lost the passion, want to get out, but there's a lease agreement, so can't get out. And you know, there, there are businesses like this. So if you are not picky, then you might go find those businesses that you can buy and that might give you at least like existing equipment or, you know, that kind of thing. So we, the, my first business was a takeaway food bar in the industrial area uh, and the owner wanted to get out. So he was very happy that we were happy to pay, uh, buy his business for like $1,000. <laughs> and right. then we had everything. So, but of course the business was losing money 
So you got to work hard to start making money, like you know, be, being profitable. So I had my daughter, you know, on my back every day. I was getting up at 5 a.m., making sandwiches, burgers, hot dogs, serving truck drivers, factory workers, and um, here I am. You know, previously I was into organic, natural food. <laughs> <laughs> healthy eating and then I was having burgers and chips and then uh, but you know if you take the judgment out of anything right like you are willing to do anything but you try to do good things so I uh, was serving burgers and chips and then uh, eventually like we, we were you know having great time with these truck drivers who would come every morning and then gradually I would start sneaking some lettuce into their burgers <laughs> You know, add some nice quiche and salad for the ladies working in the offices. And then eventually this business became very popular. So we had like track jam in, in the lunchtime and, you know, people were queuing up like out of the door um, for buying food. And so event like, very quickly, like within six months, we tripled the turnover and the business started to do well. And uh, then we bought another um little business, which was ice cream takeaway food but, uh, also. And then um, we made that into a kind of chain business. So we have now two businesses and eventually we sold the business because it was, you know, we were actually making money so we could sell it at a higher price. So with that in mind, like in place in New Zealand, we then decided to move to Australia for bigger opportunity. And then at that time we had a little bit more money <laughs> to start the next thing. So sometimes like, uh, if we don't overthink and then feel like unless we have this, 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 we can't start anything. Yeah. Yeah, if we just think about, okay, we, we have this, we only have this, what do we do? Right? Like then maybe we can find a starting point that is uh, possible <laughs> as long as we don't judge. <laughs> so when you set out to start B1G1, you've got this great new concept, you're ready to do it. Did you just begin approaching companies? What was the first idea that got that off the ground? Uh, so <laughs> so it, the idea is magical because from day one, you know, we were saying, imagine if every time you had a copy and then <clears throat> we used it at uh, that, that time. Uh, John Lennon's Imagine Song, and I created this like a very simple movie with just a black screen with just text flo floating up. Imagine if every time you have a cup of coffee, <laughs> then then people go like, "Oh, I get it, I get it." And then, but the problem was, um, how do we then make it happen? <laughs> we didn't know how to make it happen, but we knew that well, it's about the businesses thinking about what what action in their business can create a certain good and then we need to figure out how do we help make that good in the world and that means then the connections with all sort of charity organizations and their work and working together to really like break down their activities because you know building a well of course like there are lots of activities to build well because it's one of the ways to bring clean water but that could cost like five six thousand dollars to build sure. a well so one person or one business cannot say okay we pay for that entire well. So taking that into like, then how to break it down? Like how many years does this well last? How many people are in the community? And then how many uh, then people in the family uh, and so on? Then through that breakdown, then we get to a point, oh, actually bringing clean water to one person for one day is two cent or one cent or then suddenly there is the possibilities of how our everyday small thing can create great good, such as every email you are sending to somebody can actually make this impact happen if you are happy to give in a budget one cent for every email. <laughs> so yeah, so that's the kind like of much. magic. And but it took a very long time actually to yeah. at least to in establish the initial system the methodology, the enough number of charities to work with us. And yeah, but then in the, in the beginning when we didn't have a, much to promise, like features or benefits, or we just told the story and said, if you believe in this mission, then we want you to come in and join us and create this together. And then actually like uh, enough number of people, you know, business owners said, yes. <laughs> Sounds great. Because you made it easy for them. You made it easy for them to give back. Which before, yeah. like you said, they it wasn't not have too had easy idea. at the beginning. Oh, okay. <laughs> in, the, was, at the, in the beginning, was there a lot of resistance? It wasn't 
Was there a lot of resistance? Uh, no, People no, no, no. Said, no, you're I mean, crazy. Like, no, no, no. Um, okay. I, when I say it wasn't easy at the beginning, it wasn't for me or for us, but it was for the businesses because we didn't have a great, uh, you know, project list. Or so in the beginning, businesses needed to say like, okay, we want to support this course and then sign an agreement, or and then we ask them to give us money every month. Or so there was just like a very troublesome way of giving in the beginning. Sure. And it wasn't clear, you know, we, we couldn't articulate how the process worked that well. Or, so in a sense, it, we didn't make it easy for businesses to say, yeah, I want to do that. But the only thing we said, we, we communicated pretty well was to remind everybody that the reason why they all went into business wasn't just for money. They all had some ideas, something that they wanted to do, something they cared about. So we were just sharing the invitation to join in the giving movement and the giving world and to be the partner to make it happen together. So even when we didn't have a perfect system and it was troublesome, there were people who were still joining. And today it's different. It's an online subscription model. So it's easy for mm -hmm. anybody to join. Any small company can join easily. And it's very clear, like once you create an account, how to set up your giving story and you know make a contribution. It's very straightforward. But it wasn't that before. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't make it easy either. But still, um, I think this... Um, desire to create good in the world exists in all, I think, all of us. That's profound. Today's lesson in building your own sh Bessie Virginia Blount. Bessie Blount's life began as they all do by trying to write left-handed and having her hand slapped by her teacher at the age of seven. In response, Bessie learned to write with her right hand. No, that's not what we do here. Instead, in an act of defiance, she taught herself to write and read with her teeth Okay, maybe not read with her teeth, but just making sure you're still paying attention. Who would have guessed that years later, when she became a practicing physiotherapist at the Bronx Hospital, that her childhood would come back to help her? Born in 1914, her professional career was spent serving WW2 veterans, many of whom came back from the war as amputees. She taught these people to write with their mouth and teeth, just as she had learned decades ago. But many of her patients still couldn't even eat by themselves, one of the hardest frontiers of losing one's capabilities as a human. So Bessie went home and spent the hours of 1 to 4 a.m. creating an automatic feeding machine that would let somebody eat without the use of hands or arms. In 1951, she patented this device, becoming an unsung hero in the process. So you've had 14 years of success. Fantastic. And it's only going to get better from here, I can tell. You've also done public speaking and other types of engagements. You've been recognized mm -hmm. by some media like Forbes. Tell me about that side of your life, especially as somebody who said when they grew up, they were very shy and afraid <laughs> to talk to people. Now your English is amazing, I can say. How do you feel about that part of your life now? Uh, well, well, first of all, uh, I'm not good at like I, I'm still introverted. So if I if you send me to a networking event and say, "Must I go off network with people?" I will be in the corner or try to stay in the toilet or something. I'm not good at this like mingling in the bigger yeah. group. I love having one-on-one -on -one conversation like this because Same. you know that is like just connecting right? like rather than trying to impress somebody. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm not good at it, but um. Uh, what I also realized was that when I was feeling like afraid of talking or expressing or connecting, um, I was actually afraid because I was judging that maybe these people would judge me. You know, they wouldn't like what I hear. And then I was making all these like assumptions about others. And then as a result, I was afraid always. Um, but when I took out the judgment, okay, people may not like this, but I, I, I want to enjoy connecting with them <laughs> and that it'd be okay. Like if we had the different ideas or uh, I'm, because I'm very curious about hearing different ideas. So I don't want to judge their ideas. I want to be curious about what they have to say and why they think that way. So then like suddenly 
talking and expressing, connecting, exchanging ideas became very easy, you know, like no worries. <laughs> and then another thing uh, is when I said, uh, if you see this as a game, everything changes. And for me, that everything changed the moment was when I saw it as a game and I suddenly realized it wasn't about me. It wasn't about, it, I, I was not like the central thing. I was just like this piece in this game board with lots of other pieces playing it together. And for a temporary period of time, I was given a kind of like assignment to take care of this piece, you know, for this game. So I'm moving with this game, but observing what goes on. Sometimes this piece like does weird things <laughs> and right. fail or say wrong thing or you know, make mistakes. Or, That's my piece. But I'm not attached yeah. to this. <laughs> like, right. that, that's just this thing. Can and, I still get a so, new piece? Is it? Is there time in the game for another piece? Or am I stuck uh, with this piece? <laughs> you could you could try to swap the piece with somebody okay. sometimes. And yeah, say, I might need to yeah, do that. Like, I, don't, I don't really like my piece at yeah. the moment. Could you take care of it for a while? <laughs> Can I borrow your piece for 15 minutes, please? That's such yeah, a good so I, I see it that way. So it doesn't matter like when, you know, it's podcast or interview with like media. Okay, do it, do it. It's okay. But I'm not attached to this. And, and any recognition that people give, like I'm also mindful that, they, well, it's actually not about me because it's about the people and businesses that supported this idea. They re deserve the recognition right like not, not me so, mm -hmm. so i don't really like feel uh, intimidated by that anymore <laughs> that's so wonderful well i for one am profoundly grateful for the chance to connect with you so thank you very much for sharing your story i loved every single part of it and as i often want to do towards the end of our hour together i want to give you the final word here in this show so what can people do to support you, where can they find you? Or if there's an action that you want people to take right now, what would you like that to be? Okay, so uh, if anybody's interested to learn more about the b one one initiative, then please go to b1g1.com, you know, b1g1.com. And then uh, if, if you forget this naming because it's not easy to remember, then you can search buy one give one or buy something one, then one. we will come back as well and so that's one and another thing is i uh, like to connect with people on linkedin um that's kind of my preferred uh media so if you want to find me on linkedin then you can search masami sato and then you can follow me or connect with me or if your company is interested to explore uh, how you can embed you know social impact in what you are doing then please reach out to me message me and then we can take you through like how that could work with your business as well. So thank you for the opportunity, Rose, for letting me share. And it's been a great, great pleasure. So much fun. The <laughs> pleasure is entirely mine. I support, I, it, it feels superfluous, but I support everything you believe and I support everything you've done. You probably think, oh, he's an overly flattering American, but I genuinely do <laughs> believe in your story and how you got there and what you're doing. That is absolutely the truth. So keep on doing what you're doing. Your philosophy is excellent, I think, and you have attained that rare thing. And you don't have to admit this, but I believe you have attained that rare thing that people search for called wisdom that so few people have. And I'm going to take a lot of real joy away from listening back to this when I edit it. And I'm going to try to remember that lesson about seeing life as a game and what can I do with my peace in the next five to 14 years. I'm going to think about that one a lot. So with that, the official podcast is over. Oh.